Man, it's been too long. Are you guys excited to be at church this morning? Would you make some noise and prove it for me real quick? Say this with me. Say, attack mode. Attack mode. Initiated. Initiated. That's right. And if you're a first timer and you have no idea what that means, every year around here, we ask God for a word or a phrase to build our year around. And for the year of 2022, that phrase is the phrase attack mode. And all that means is to come rain or shine, pandemic or no pandemic, online or in person. And regardless of the political climate that may or may not take place within our country at any given point this year, we are done living in survival mode. And we're done waiting on God to show up and do everything that he's already asked us to do. And so in the name of that, we've decided to go full on attack mode, to play a little bit of offense and do everything we can to start building the kingdom of God right here in this community, trusting that as we do our part, that God's going to come alongside and do his part. Amen. Anyone in for attack mode 2022? Okay. Well, in the name of that, of embracing this attitude, because it's not just a mantra, it's not just a phrase. It's an attitude. People that are going on attack mode, they walk differently. They look differently. They have a little bit of a different swag about them. So in the name of embracing the attitude of attack mode, one of my hopes, prayers, desires for 2022 is that Overflow Church this year, or or that this year would be the most life-giving, fruitful, and healthy year in the history of our church, and really even in the history of each of your lives. And so in the name of that health that I am believing God for, for our church and for your lives, uh, today we're going to kick off a series that sounds like it's straight out of Men's Health Magazine, and that's because the title of this series is Stronger, Better Core. Stry- you see what I'm saying now? It feels like there should be a guy with a ripped six-pack right behind the series title. Stronger, Better Core. Uh, it's, no, it's no secret that because this is January, many of us in the room are eating healthier than we have in a long time, and we're going to the gym probably more regularly than we have in a long time. And if you're like me, the reason you're doing that, or or maybe even just the reason you've committed to ever doing that at any point in your life, is because you wanted a stronger, better, more defined core. You wanted uh, wanted six-packs. You wanted to be shredded. And and if we're being honest, there's nothing wrong with having a six-pack, but if, if we're being honest... For most of us, the reason that we wanted a six-pack at any point in our life, it had nothing to do with health, and it had everything to do with vanity. We wanted to show up at the beach, and people go, dang, look at his six-pack. Man, he's killing it right now. And if that's you, no shame. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make you raise your hand because I'm right there with you. That has most certainly been me probably now and probably lots of other time in my life. But something that people neglect, and something that a lot of people don't know, is that having a stronger, better, and even more defined core isn't just beneficial aesthetically. It's not just good for looks. Your core muscles actually affect every other part of your body. If your core is weak, then that can lead to back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, knee pain, all kinds of of different pains. And so if you want to continue growing and thriving and being the best kind of like physical shape that you can be, and, and even avoiding a little bit of pain along the way, then developing a stronger, better core is something that you're going to want to have to do. And so knowing this, over the last few months, I, along with tons of help from many of our leaders here at Overflow, I've been trying to strengthen and even bring some definition to the core values of Overflow Church. Um, And whether you know it or not, whether they know it or not, whether it's written down, whether it's just internalized, every church, every organization, every family, and even every person has core values that drive who you are and who they are and what they do. And that's exactly what core values are. Core values are principles that define who you are, what you do, and why you do it. Core values, for those of you taking notes, are principles that determine who you are, they, de- they define who you are, what you do, and why you do it. For example, just by a show of hands, has anyone in here ever seen the Fast and Furious movie franchise? <laughs> has anyone in here seen all the videos of Dominic Toretto that have gone viral over the year of 2021? If you have, if you're on TikTok at all, you already know that Dominic Toretto, one of the main characters of that movie franchise, one of his core values is what? Someone tell me family. I love it. I love Overflow Church, man. There are some churches that if I'd said Fast and Furious, they'd have been like, you watch Fast and Furious and you're all like, family, we know what you're talking about. I appreciate you. But yeah, one of his core values 
his family. He goes to jail for his family. He breaks the law for his family. He does all kinds of stuff for his family. And why? Because loyalty to his family is at the core of his value system. It drives who he is. It drives what he does and why he does it. And for about six years now, here at Overflow, we have had a list of core values. They've been good. They've been beneficial. And the only problem with them is that we stole them from another church. We, uh, when, when, when Overflow first started, none of us knew what we were doing. And so we reached to a lot of different churches and was like, help us, help us, help us. One specific church was like, these are our core values. And we thought, wow, those sound really good. We're going to make them our core values now. And so what we've been doing is over the last six months, uh, me and a lot of our leaders around here, we have been working to build our own stronger, better core, a, a collection of values that embody who we are as a church rather than who that church was as a church, a collection of values that will bring clarity to the mission, to the calling that God's given us as a church. And then of course, a collection of values that clearly communicate the why behind every move that we make and decision that we make from this point forward. And so to start the year, what we're going to do is we're going to take the next handful of weeks to talk through every single one of those new values. Uh, and in doing that, my hope is that we'll not only strengthen the core of who we are as a church collectively, but I also hope that these values begin to bring some clarity and definition as to what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus individually. And so you take taking notes for the title of our first sermon within the Stronger, Better Core series and the first core value that we're going to talk about. It's this. We are secretly awesome. Here at Overflow Church, we are people committed to being secretly awesome. And if you're confused about what this means, it's okay. Every one of our leaders was also confused the first time I said this. They were like, this sounds kind of inappropriate. Like, I don't know if we should call ourselves awesome. Hang in there with me. Don't sweat about it because I'm going to take the rest of this sermon to explain to you exactly what that means. And first and foremost, I'm going to do that uh, by starting in the book of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew today. Matthew chapter number six, to be specific. Matthew chapter six, we'll start in verse number five. Matthew six, verse five. If you're watching online, it'll be on the screen so you can follow along with us as well. I'm going to give you three more seconds to turn there. Matthew should be one that's pretty easy to get to. It's the first book in your New Testament. So here we go. Matthew six, verse number five. It says this, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by everybody else. But truly, I say to you, they've already received their reward. So when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your father who's in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then I want you to skip down to verse number 16. It says this, and when you fast, don't look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, They've already received their reward. So when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by everybody else, but rather by your father who sees in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So hopefully you're catching on at this point. But in case you're not, when I say that here at Overflow, we have to become people who are committed to being secretly awesome, I'm saying that we are people committed to consistently implementing the not-so-secret ingredients that lead to long-term spiritual success and growth, which are, in no particular order, prayer, reading the Bible, and fasting. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about the rest of the day. So if you're taking notes, topic number one, subject number one, is the subject of prayer. Number one, prayer. Where do I even begin with prayer? Prayer is the greatest opportunity ever afforded mankind. Prayer is the divine means through which the creation gets to communicate with the creator. Prayer is the opportunity and the ability to not only learn about God, but to interact with God. Prayer is the route through which any believer can intentionally access the presence of an all-knowing, all-powerful, supremely good God at any time at all. That is prayer. And even with all that being true, you want to know the one problem with prayer? We don't do it. <laughs> we don't pray. My previous pastor used to say it like this. He'd say, everybody assumes that everyone prays, but hardly anyone actually prays. 
We talk a lot about prayer. We read a lot about prayer. We think a lot about prayer. We post a lot about prayer. I'm praying for you. We post a lot about prayer, but we do very little actual praying. And there are a lot of reasons for, or uh, as to why this is the case. I think, um, we all have excuses. Um, I've made excuses. You've made excuses. There are excuses we've all made concerning our lack of prayer. Uh, there are some that are more understandable than others. There are some that are just kind of pathetic. Um, for example, maybe your excuse for why you don't pray is that you don't have enough time to pray. Let's, I, I mean, I'm not even going to stay there long because we all know that's the worst excuse on the book. Don't ever say it. Don't ever come to me and say it because you're lying. You just, you have not, you've not made the time because you have time for football and you have time to do your hair, but, but you don't have time for prayer. So maybe that's an excuse, but maybe, maybe your excuse is that you really don't know how, or you're intimidated by prayer or you go to pray and you're not really sure what to say, and it just kind of gets awkward, and you feel like you're wasting your time, or maybe, maybe you feel unworthy to pray. Maybe because of your week, because of some different decisions you've made that were questionable, you feel like you're not really even sure if you're allowed to pray, or maybe if we're being honest, prayer, like my, my brother up front down here, he said it just a second ago, maybe if we're honest, we could just admit that prayer is just a little too boring for our overstimulated 21st century minds sometimes. Like I said, we all got the excuses. Me, you, everybody. We got them. Uh, but I didn't show up today to like confront our outdated and kind of pathetic excuses of why we don't pray. But I also did not show up today to give you step-by-step -step instructions on, on, on how to pray the best way. Number one, I didn't show up to give you step-by-step -step instructions because I've already done that. Uh, the last two years, I've preached two sermons where we did that. In April of 2020, I preached a sermon called How Do I Pray? And last year, in January of 2021, I preached a sermon called Pray Like This. If that would be valuable to you, if you're new to prayer and you're not really sure where to even begin, go to Overflow's YouTube channel, subscribe and like while you're there, leave a few comments and, re and listen to those sermons. Watch those sermons, take notes. I promise it'll be valuable to you. But number two, the reason that I didn't show up today to give you like step-by-step -step instructions on how to pray the best way is because there is no such thing as the best way to pray. I hope someone's told you that, but if no one's ever told you, there is no such thing as the best way to pray. You can pray while screaming and shouting and jumping up and down in intercession on behalf of someone else for 45 minutes, and you can pray without even saying a word, laying on your face and just listening for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. You can pray uh, in a casual, conversational style where it's just you and God and y'all are hanging out, just talking back and forth and listening, and you can pray using the Lord's Prayer prayer as your template uh, to guide your efforts. You can pray while you're walking your dog. You can pray on your way to work. You can pray in your living room. You can pray in your bedroom. You can pray at church. You can pray at your workplace. You can pray in the bathroom. You can pray however there is no right or wrong way to pray. It's all good. There's an appropriate time for all of it. But regardless of how you pray or how at least you should be praying, the fact remains, Christians pray. Christians pray. That's the shortest note you'll take all day long today, but you need to know. Christians pray. We should stop calling ourselves Christians if we're not engaging in prayer because it is a fundamental value of Christianity. Christians do pray outside of church and on their own. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Matthew chapter six, verse six. We just read it, but let's read it again. It says this, but when, say that word when. when, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you up front. There is so much to unpack in this one verse and I don't have time to do it. I've actually done it. It's in a sermon called how do I pray? So you can go back and watch that sermon. If you want me to unpack that verse for you again, the only thing I do want to point out here is my favorite word in that verse. And it's the word when. Notice Jesus doesn't look at his disciples and say, if you pray, and he doesn't say that some of you, especially the preachers and deacons and leaders and the Pope and monks that they should pray. But others of you, you're fine. Just go to church once a week. No, no. He says, when you pray, when you being you, not just me, you, when you, as my disciples take time out of your day, when no one else is watching to pray and seek my face. Okay. Let's be in case no one's ever told you in case no one's ever like laid this out for you. The call to Christianity is not the call to compartmentalize our interactions with God to 
one day a week on Sundays between that 20 to 40 minute worship set that happens every time. That's not the call to Christianity. This is going to sound a little bit blunt, but I can't afford to be vague with this. Okay. Biblically speaking, we should stop identifying ourselves as followers or disciples of Jesus. If we are not regularly engaging in personal private moments of prayer, because Christians pray, Christians pray, we should stop calling ourselves Christians. If we only go to church, that is not what being a Christian is all about. Prayer is something that Christians do, no matter what it looks like. If it's for 10 minutes, it's for 15 minutes. If it's for five minutes, if it's for incremental moments all throughout the day, if it's while you're working in your head, out of your mouth, Christians pray. Amen. We good with that. Okay. Number one, if you want to become secretly awesome, it means that you are committing yourself, whether you are 10 years old or 90 years old, you have committed to a lifestyle of prayer. Number two, being secretly awesome means that you read the Bible, reading the Bible, understanding scripture, studying out God's word. Look at Psalm 1, 1 real quick. It says this, Oh, the joys of those who don't follow the advice of the wicked or stand with sinners or join in with mockers, but instead they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They, people who do this, they're like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither and they prosper in everything that they do. This is very, it's very clear. It's saying people who delight in God's word, who spend time reading God's word, who spend time memorizing God's word, who constantly think about God's word. They are like trees planted beside a river and concerning trees planted beside a body of water. All you need to know is that their roots grow deeper. And because of that, they are stronger, meaning that when the wind and when the waves and when the storms approach and hit them, those trees are just fine. And in the same sense, for those of you, for those of us who are regularly and consistently planting ourselves in the word of God, when stressful and even terrible situations show up in your life, you shouldn't have to worry about being blown away or crumbling under that. Why? Because you've developed a root system. Think about it. Roots, roots go down in a place where no one can see them. Why are trees, trees strong? Because they're becoming awesome in secret where no one can see when no one's watching. That's what being secretly awesome is all about. It's about you developing a system of roots so that no matter what happens in your life, no matter what chaos shows up, no matter how your marriage is going, no matter what's happening in your work, you're good, man. You're steady. You're stable. You're producing fruit in every season of your life. No one ever has to wonder if you're going to show up. No one ever has to wonder how you're going to be acting. Yeah, you're going to go through some stuff and you're going to hurt sometimes, but you're stable and you're steady. Why? Because you've become secretly awesome. And I want to be very clear, especially for our younger crowd in here. Consuming a sermon is not equal to consuming the word. Consuming a sermon is not a substitute for consuming the word. Please listen to Pastor Stephen Furtick and Levi Lusco and Matt Chandler and Paul Washer and Billy Graham and everyone else you want to listen to. Listen to me. It's good. It's great. It's necessary. It's actually really important. But at the same time, you want to know what we call that? Fast food. That's fast food. Why? Because that's food you didn't labor over. Someone else labored over that. They spent, we spent 15 hours on the sermon. You didn't. You showed up and you got it in 30 minutes. That's fast food and eating fast food once a week. That's cool. That's convenient. It's tasty. It's fun. It's actually really useful sometimes, especially when you're stressed and you're tired and you don't want to have to go home and cook. But if you want to be healthy, you already know you can't eat fast food for every meal. You can't eat fast food every single day. If you want a balanced, nutritious diet, something that's going to promote growth, then at some point you're going to have to learn how to cook for yourself. And it's no different as it applies to your spiritual growth. If the only nutrition that you're getting is from one day a week, from one and a half hours on a Sunday, or from someone else's sermon every single week, you're only going to grow in very small increments over a large period of time. But if you start learning how to feed from God's word on your own, you'll begin growing and running faster than you could have ever imagined. We got to become secretly awesome, man. It's, it's God's word 
that's going to give you the nutrients that you need to consistently grow and to consistently become more like God and, and, and consistently chase after his purpose for your life. Listening to sermons is important. Going to a worship set is important. Listening to Christian music is important. Loving people is important. Praying is important. We just talked about how important prayer is, but did you know you can't even pray the right way if you don't know the word of God? You can't even pray the right way without knowing God's word. Some of you love prayer and you love worship, but you don't love the word, but you can't even pray and worship biblically the right way if you don't know the word. Let me prove it to you. First John, first John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, well, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. My goodness, I grew up charismatic Pentecostal environment where we would say that verse with fire in our bones. If you pray, he'll, have, he'll hear your prayer and he'll respond. God hears you. He's not far away. And we capitalize on this. God hears you. Prayers can be answered, but then we leave out this. It's like this little clause that's thrown in there because this is what it says. I want you to, or I'll read it again. It says, if we ask anything, according to his will, then he will hear us and then he will answer the prayer. Meaning God only answers prayers that line up with his will. And you want to know the only way to understand God's will. Someone tell me his word, his word. The only way to know God's will is by knowing God's word. God, some of you would commit to just learning what the Bible actually has to say, you would stop having to ask the question, is this God speaking to me or is this just me speaking to me? You stop looking stupid in prayer meetings when you prayed stuff that didn't line up with the Bible. And you want to you know why that's the case? Because the Holy Spirit is never going to speak anything to you in prayer that doesn't line up with everything God's already written in his word. You, you would, some of you would be surprised you would really struggle being the person who always has something negative to call out about someone in the prayer meeting, who's always hearing from God about something horrible someone else is doing. You'd really struggle being that person because if you read 1 Corinthians 13, it says love is patient, love is kind, and love believes the best about everybody. Well, if you, if you read that, then you'd know it's probably not God that's slandering that person to you in the place of prayer. I know it's crazy, but he tells us in his word, not to slander and not to gossip. So why would you think that God is slandering or gossiping about other people to you? Right? It don't work that way. But, but you don't read the word. So now you're the person that is causing drama and causing strife. So I want to encourage you. You need the word. We need the word. And, and once again, I want to say for like kind of our younger people in here today, this is really important for you. The generation before us, grew up with, a, with an overemphasis on the word and an underemphasis on prayer, which led to churches where people knew the Bible inside and out, but they were devoid of anything that even closely resembled the presence of God. But our generation has grown up now with an overemphasis on prayer and worship, and we don't know an ounce of what the Bible actually has to say. And so that's leading to churches now that, that, uh, that, that we have powerful worship teams and powerful prophetic moments that just so happen to be completely devoid of anything that even closely resembles truth. We need the word of God. You need the word of God. If you want to grow, you need the word of God. It is not enough to just come to church. It's not enough to just listen to Chris Tomlin or Maverick City Music on your way to work every day. It's not enough. You need the Bible. You need God's word. And, and if you're not really sure where to start, I will give you some little beginner uh, encouragements here. Okay, If you're not sure where to start, number one, pick an amount of time every day that you can commit to reading the Bible. If it's 10 minutes, do 10 minutes. If it's 20 minutes, do 20 minutes. At one point in my life, I did this thing called a 30-30. I read the Bible for 30 minutes every day. As soon as I finished, I prayed for 30 minutes. Or sometimes you know, I prayed at night and read my Bible in the morning or whatever. But I committed to a 30 30. Uh, if you don't want to do like an amount of time, pick an amount of chapters. You know what I'm saying? Don't pick 10 chapters because you're not going to stick with that. I, I know y'all too well. I know me too well. You ain't going to stick with 10 chapters. Pick three every day. I can read three chapters or maybe even start with one. That'd be more than what most of us are doing right now anyway. So pick an amount of chapters or pick a time that you can read. And once you've done that and once you're ready to start reading, don't start in the book of Revelation. 
Don't start in the book of Job. Please don't start in Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Lamentations. God forbid, don't start in the Song of Songs. That's going to make some of you blush if you start there. So don't do that either. Start, and this is just my opinion. No, the Holy Spirit didn't get up here and tell me. Tell these people they can only start in this. This is my opinion. This is coming from someone who's been doing this for a while. Start in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, even the book of Acts. Familiarize yourself with Jesus, with who he is, with what he said, with how he lived. Familiarize yourselves with the disciples, with the early church. It's super encouraging when you read some of this stuff and it, and it begins to give you a really good introduction to who God is because Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. You want to know what God's like? Read about Jesus and you find out exactly what God's like. As you're doing that, don't be afraid uh, to, to venture into the books of of Romans and first and second Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. These are letters that were written by the apostle Paul after Jesus had risen from the dead. These are letters that Paul wrote to the early church, man. They're, they're incredibly encouraging. They're convicting. They're full of promises. They're even full of doctrine. If you have never read through Romans, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Hebrews, all that stuff, you don't even know what you believe as a Christian. That is, dude, these are the doctrinal books. You have to familiarize yourself with this stuff as you're doing it, as you're enjoying that, because it is super enjoyable. Don't be afraid to dive into the book of Psalms. I used to read a Psalm every single day. I used to use it to help me in my prayer time. Once again, super encouraging. They're all about Jesus. I love the book of Psalms. And then even though it will be intimidating at some point, you have to familiarize yourself with the old Testament. You cannot leave it out. It's important especially the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These, this is the scripture that Jesus read. Je that's Jesus's form of scripture. That's where he's quoting from. So I think it would probably be a good idea if we knew it as well. You got to familiarize yourself with the whole Bible if you really want to understand who Jesus is. From page one to the final word, we believe that the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. Without any of it, you cannot fully understand who Jesus is. So I encourage you, read the Bible. So number one, if you want to be secretly awesome, it means committing to a lifestyle of prayer. Number two, being secretly awesome means reading and then eventually studying and then eventually understanding your Bible and what it has to say. And then number three, the toughest one, being secretly awesome means fasting. Being secretly awesome means fasting. The, the most uncomfortable F word of them all. Fasting. Write that down. Matthew 6, 16. We read it a second ago. It says this. This is Jesus. When you fast. I just want to stop right there. Does it sound familiar? To any of the other verses we just read a second ago, without when, when you fast, don't look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting might be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've already received their reward. But when, say when. Oh, man, that was so pathetic. Say when. Hey, that's the passion I was looking for. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others but by your father who's in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. It may not be a stretch for most of us to identify with statements like, living as a Christian means serving others and loving others and treating our neighbors like we want to be treated and helping in our community and outreach and evangelism. And it may not be hard to identify with a statement like, following Jesus should accompany me praying and reading my Bible and embracing a lifestyle of holiness and sexual purity. This is stuff that if you grew up in church like me, you grew up hearing. This is not new to any of us. But fasting? Mm, you know, yeah, fasting is for, it's for monks and, and fasting is for, uh, is for preachers and fasting is for deacons and fasting is for elite Christians and fasting is for anyone but me because I don't really want to fast. But once again, let me refer you to verse number 16. It says, when you fast, the call to fast 
isn't an invitation reserved for the radical few. The call to fast is an expectation placed on every single believer, placed on every single one of Jesus's followers. Let me prove it to you. Matthew 9, 14. One day, the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, why don't your disciples fast like we and the Pharisees do? And Jesus replied, will do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away. This is Jesus talking about him no longer being on the earth after his resurrection. Someday the groom will be taken away and then they will fast. Again, Jesus is leaving no room for the question here. They will fast. So I know that fasting is probably a new concept for some of us, but just know this is not some crazy, unheard of, brand new, unique idea that I'm bringing to the table. Jesus fasted. He told us to fast and nearly every single major biblical character fasted, even outside of the fast that they had to do as Jewish people, like all of them, David, Moses, Elijah, Anna, Esther, Daniel, Paul, every single New Testament church leader. Fasting is not reserved for the Navy SEALs of the Christian faith. Fasting is reserved for you. Say this. Say, for me? Go on, one more time. Say, for me? Yes. Fasting is reserved for me. Fasting is, in fact, reserved for you. And if that's the case, what we need to know now is what is fasting. Because all you got to do is get on TikTok and you'll hear a bunch of garbage about anything Bible related. It doesn't take long to hear people use the word fast out of context. And so instead of me just telling you my idea of what I think fasting is, maybe, maybe first what we should do, I mean, you know, if this is wrong, someone correct me, but maybe we ought to figure out that we're fast. Maybe let's figure out what it actually means in the Bible, and then we'll work our way from there. So if you were to look up the word fast in its original Hebrew language, because that is what originally the Bible was written in, if you translate it to the Hebrew language, this word would be a word called sum, T-S-U-W-M, sum. And it means to cover the mouth or literally to abstain from food. This is what fat, the word fast actually means. And I bring this up because it's, it's very likely you're going to hear this. And, and, and I've heard it my whole life. I hear Christians use word, the, the word fast out of context. I've used the word fast out of context for years and years and years. You'll hear that. You'll hear it like this. Okay. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard this. I feel like God's asking me to fast from watching TV. I feel like God's asking me to fast from secular music. I feel like God's asking me to fast from, from dating for a season of my life. And while all that's good and stuff like that absolutely goes hand in hand with fasting, as we'll talk about here in a second, and God is not afraid to ask you to do stuff like that at any given time in your life, none of that's considered fasting. Why? Because the word fast literally means to abstain from food. And so if you were to say, oh, I'm fasting from TV, what you would be communicating with your language is, I'm abstaining from food from TV. Doesn't make any sense, right? Because the word fast means to abstain from food. And so that's what every fast has to do with. And if you read the Bible, fasting happens differently all over the, all over the place. Sometimes people fast for one day, half a day, seven days, 21 days, 40 days. Sometimes people fast food and water for a period of time, which I don't suggest anybody doing. Sometimes people um, fast just food for a period of time. And then other times people fast certain desirable foods for that period of time. That's what we see in the book of Daniel. So we call the Daniel fast. He fasted from like meat and sweets and different stuff like that. And, and, but all together, when you read the Bible, fasting always has to do with abstaining from some form of food. And I, and I, I just, while, while fasting practically, because there's some practical applications to fasting as well. And while it practically helps you to regain control over the power your stomach has over you, because believe it or not, your stomach has a lot of power over you. Anyone who's ever been hangry knows that your stomach has power over you. You can go to church, sing, love Jesus, walk out of the church, be hungry, and scream at your wife or scream at your husband, and it's because of your stomach. So while fasting practically does help you regain power over your stomach and regain power over your physical appetite, fasting also brings growth and maturity to your spiritual appetite. As you fast and pray, your hunger pains for food turn into hunger pains for more of God. Man, 
I've been there. I've seen it. As you fast and pray, and of course, you know, read your Bible. Fasting turns your hunger pains for more of food into hunger pains for more of God. And if there's anything you write down about fasting today, I want you to write this down. Fasting is not about weight loss and fasting is not about simply not eating food. Fasting is about choosing God over everything else, choosing God over everything else. And I say everything. And that's exactly why there are other things that should accompany your fasting. There are other principles and other things that you should be applying when you fast. Number one, Matthew six tells us when you fast, you ain't supposed to be whining about it. You, he literally, that is what he is saying. Stop whining about your fasting. If you're going to fast, don't complain about it. Either do it or don't do it, but don't be talking. If you fast with a group of people, don't go out to lunch and fast the things you're fasting with and spend your whole lunch time talking about how much you wish you could have this. And then number two, he says, don't be bragging about your fasting. No one should even know you're fasting. Obviously, sometimes corporate fast happen, but like you don't fast and post about it on Facebook man, I can't wait for this fast to be over. Or, or you post so that everyone knows you're fasting and they see you as like some kind of super hyper, you know, spiritual being and they look at you better. He's like, no, no, don't do that. So number one, we don't do that. Number two, when you fast, you read your Bible and you pray more than you normally would. To, to be very clear, if you decide to fast, but you don't decide and you're not committed to reading your Bible every day and spending a good amount of time in prayer every day, you shouldn't fast. Because not eating food does nothing for you concerning your relationship with God. God, he's not, he just, if that was the case, God honors dieting. And I promise you, I don't, I don't, God, he really, he, he loves your physical health, but fasting is not about your physical health. It's about you choosing God over everything else. And you know what it looks like to choose God? Prayer and reading your Bible. So if you're not going to pray and read your Bible, then you shouldn't even fast. And then the third thing that should always accompany fasting is this word called consecration. And this is a super churchy, Bible-y word that I don't use a whole lot because most people don't even know what it means. But all it means, this word consecration, if you read your Bible, you'll see it all over. It means to stay away from or to set yourself apart from. If you are consecrated, it means you have been set apart for a special and unique purpose. And when you fast, there are certain things you should be setting yourself apart from, consecrating yourself from. For example, like first and foremost, it makes no sense to give up eating food in the name of desiring more of God and then continue living in habitual sin. It makes no sense to give up eating food and then to continue watching pornography every night. It makes no sense to fast and then continue spouting off and screaming at your spouse and not honoring them or harboring unforgiveness or, or getting drunk or engaging in premarital sex or, or, or gossiping or any other kind of divisive speech. It makes no sense to fast and do that kind of stuff. Also, it makes no sense to fast and drink every night. It makes no sense to fast and get up every morning and feed yourself trash music when you go to the gym. It makes no sense to fast and then spend three to four hours every single day watching TV and scrolling on Facebook and Instagram and, and TikTok. It makes no sense. These are things we give up. Some of that stuff we give up as Christians. <laughs> Some of that, you know, the part about watching pornography and sleeping around and unforgiveness, loving your neighbor and not being angry. All that, that's just Christian stuff. That's not even just fasting stuff. But like now would be a good time to implement that is if you're fasting. But like some of this other stuff, scrolling for hours and hours on social media and listening to garbage music and drinking every single night and playing video games for hours upon hours every single day, that's stuff we give up when we're fasting. And I, and I, I want to make sure you understand this and I'm loud and clear. I don't want to like leave you in the shadows because God doesn't, he doesn't honor fasting done the wrong way. Check out Isaiah 58 sometime when you, when you have the time. It, it's terrifying. Honestly, it's terrifying. I think it's Isaiah. Let me look real quick. I mean, it may be Ezekiel. Hold on. Let me check it out. Yeah, it's Isaiah. God has a lot to say about fasting done the wrong way. He says, done, done the wrong way, done with greed and anger and malice in your heart and de divisive speech and sexual immorality. That's meaningless. It's powerless. And I wish you wouldn't do it at all. He literally says that. But in the same sentence or in, in the same sense of mind, what you need to know is that fasting done the right way with the right motives. It is a catalyst of epic proportions to your relationship with God and to your experience with God. It, it, it helps in so many different ways. Obviously, it helps you want God more than you want other things. That is the goal of fasting. But man, you'll be surprised. You'll, it, it'll, it'll make you be hungry for the word, make you be hungry for prayer, 
you'll start to see breakthrough in areas of your life that you haven't seen breakthrough in in a long time. You'll start hearing God in ways that you haven't heard God in ever. You might even start operating in spiritual gifts that you haven't operated in. It's not because God is waiting for you to fast for he's going to do this. It's because when you fast, you start wanting God more. When you want God more, you seek God more. When you seek God more, you find God more. That, that's what fasting is all about. And so, so there you have it. If you're wondering what we mean when we say being secretly awesome, it means to be somebody who's committed to cultivating a relationship with God when no one else is watching through the avenues of regular and daily prayer, reading the Bible, and even fasting. And I promise you, if you apply that to your life, even though I know this sermon isn't one that I would refer to as a banger. Sometimes I know, man, this sermon is going to be so much fun and we're going to jump and we're going to shout. I'm going to leave encouraged and I'm going to want to run through a wall on my way out. I know this ain't that one. I get it. This is meat and potatoes. This is teaching. This is called discipleship. Crazy that we're doing this right now in church. I know that y'all didn't stand up going, oh my God, he told us to pray and read our Bibles and fast. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I get it. I promise you though, if you apply what we talked about today, this is the most powerful sermon you will ever hear. Period. Period. It is the singular, most important and powerful message you will ever hear if applied. If applied. And that application looks different for every single one of us, but there is a very immediate application to this message as well. Write this date down, and they're going to put it up on the screen. And up front, I messed up the date, okay? It says Saturday, January 15th. That is not the date. It's Friday, January 14th. Friday, January 14th, we are starting our annual 21-day church-wide fast. Not Saturday, okay? Friday, because if we do it on Saturday, then it's not 21 days. So that was all me. I'm obviously... I'm not a math whiz. Notice I'm a preacher, so I don't have to use math a whole lot. So clearly I can't even do addition right, but it is what it is. Friday, January 14th, after you eat dinner, go ahead, eat your last meal. We'll call it, we'll literally make a thing out of it. We'll call it the last supper and we'll all eat. And when you go to Maria's, eat whatever you want to eat, watch whatever, play video games, whatever. But after that last meal on Friday, January 14th, we as a church are beginning our annual 21 day church wide fast. And I want to encourage every single person in here to take part in it. I'm not inviting you. I'm challenging you to take part in it. An invitation, it's almost like, hey, come to my birthday if you have some time. But, but like, this is more like your boss saying it's time uh, to have a meeting. Not that I'm your boss, but this is how I want you to, to see this. This is not like, man, you should really think about doing this. This is, if you're a part of this church, do this. I challenge you to do this. And it, it can look different for any of you. And we'll talk about that here in a second. I challenge you, though. Engage in this fast with us. Last year, the testimonies that came from this fast, they were overwhelming, man. We saw people see prayers get answered that they've been praying for years. We saw spiritual gifts activated. We saw people turn into leaders. We saw people have these, these encounters with God that never in a million years that they thought they were even worthy enough to have. And so I want to invite you to do that, but that's not the only cool part. Write this next date down, okay? I want to make sure I say this one right. February 4th. February 4th, Friday, February 4th will be the first slow night of the year. So what that means is that we're going to fast and pray and read our Bibles and be consecrated for 21 days. And on that Friday night, we're going to come together as a church and we're going to go after the presence of God and end our fast with the first slow night of the year. Just saying, God, we've been saying this whole time, we want you more than anything else. And we're going to come in here that night and that's going to be the mantra. We choose God. We choose God over my time, over my preferences, over my diet, over my whatever. We choose God. And I promise you, when we do that, God will show up and we'll have encounters with God. So those dates, very important. This coming Friday, the fast starts this Friday. So I say that because over the course of the next few days, you need to be talking with your spouses about this. This isn't something that married couples do separately. This is something that they talk about and they pray about together because God tells you to give up TV for 21 days and doesn't tell your husband that there's going to be some weird moments where he's watching TV by himself and you just, I guess, have to go to your, your room and read your Bible or, or whatever. So I encourage our married couples 
talk through that, figure out what God's asking you to do. And just to kind of reiterate some of what's already been said, when you fast, number one, you abstain from some type of food. It doesn't have to be food altogether. It could be, I'm not going to eat bread, or I'm not going to eat meat, or I'm not going to eat any dessert, or I'm not going to eat breakfast every single day. It could be whatever God tells you to do. But we do abstain from food. Number two, we spend intentional time praying and worshiping God every single day. Number three, we fill ourselves with God's word. We feast on the word. Number four, we set ourselves apart from certain things, whether that's video games, TV, Netflix, Hulu, secular music, you name it. We consecrate ourselves from something. Whatever it is God's asking you, that's what you do. And then number five, when we fast, we don't complain about our fast and we don't advertise it. We don't tell everybody about our fast so that we look holier than everyone. You know what we do? We just live holy. We live holy. We, we keep ourselves from spouting off in, in, in anger and from living in sexual immorality and from, and from operating in greed and, and whatever and from wasting our time and from wasting even our money. We, we get intentional with how we live and we don't, we don't talk about it. And I promise you, if you do this, alongside the rest of this church. I promise you two things. A, you will not regret it. You won't regret it. As hard as it might be for some of you to do some of these things, you won't regret it. And B, it'll be valuable. You'll get something from it. I don't know what that is. Uh, I, and I'm not going to stand up here and tell you exactly what you're going to get from it, but you will. God rewards fasting. It's right there in Matthew 6. He says, those who fast in secret, the Father rewards them. You will be rewarded. For this. So I can bake those two promises up front, but this, this is what it looks like to be secretly awesome. So I want to invite you to stand up on your feet for just a second. As we get ready to roll out this afternoon, I want to bring up one more thing. Nobody leaving right now. Nobody leaving. Nobody leaving. I want to bring up one more thing. While fasting and reading your Bible and prayer are all things that help you mature and grow and nurture your relationship with God. Fasting and reading your Bible and prayer do not earn you a relationship with God. Jesus earns you a relationship with God. His sinless life, his death, his resurrection, you being loved by God has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your works, with your good deeds, with your effort, with your fasting, with your reading or your praying. You being loved and accepted by God has only to do with Jesus and everything that he's done. And so today, as we get ready to go and probably eat something and stress about what our fast is going to look like starting on Friday, for anybody in here who maybe you had a really, really tough Christmas break, maybe, maybe you've had a rough couple of years. Whether, whether you grew up serving God and going to church and you got baptized and you said a prayer or whether you've just never said yes to Jesus at all, if you feel far from God right now, I feel like your relationship with God is skewed or if it, you just know you don't have one, you know you've never said yes to following Jesus. You've never placed your faith in Jesus as God's son and received the forgiveness and the grace that, he's, that he offers you. If you know that's you, then here in a moment, I want to pray with you and I want to give you the opportunity to make a fresh start with God. And what I mean when I say that, it's a term that we say all the time here at Overflow Church because it embodies a lot. When I say you making a fresh start with God, all I mean is you saying yes to Jesus for the first time or for the first time in a long time. So with eyes closed all over the room, for the sake of everybody in here who need to make a fresh start with God, eyes closed. If you say, Alex, that's me. You're talking to me. I feel like God's far away, or maybe I just never said yes to God at all, but I'm ready. I'm ready to go all in. Then on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. Thank you guys so much for tuning into the message today. Hope it was meaningful to you. And if it was, be sure to subscribe to Overflow Church's YouTube page. And if you want to give into the move of God happening here at Overflow, you can do that through our website or through our app. Hope you guys have an incredible day.